Hello everyone and uh, welcome to our webinar. I'm Jennifer Burnett, the Director of Fiscal and Economic Development here at the Council of State Governments. And we are excited to be collaborating today with the Griffith Insurance Foundation uh, on this webinar, which is the second in a four-part series that will be taking place on Thursdays at 2 o'clock Eastern Time throughout the rest of the month. This series is designed to provide policymakers information on risk management and insurance fundamentals through the lens of critical and emerging issues. Uh, note that we will take questions throughout the webinar and at the end, which you can type into the questions box on the side of your screen. Um, we'll get them and then we'll ask our panelists today those questions. Also, this webinar is being recorded and will be available along with the PowerPoint slides on CSG's Knowledge Center next week. With that, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, uh, Frank Tomasello of the Griffith Education Foundation. Frank serves as the Program Director for Public Policy at uh, Griffith and he'll provide us some background on today's webina webinar presenter. Frank? Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, the Griffith Insurance Education Foundation is uh, pleased to be collaborating with CSG on this four-part series on risk management and insurance fundamentals. Uh, both Griffith and CSG share similar missions, which include a commitment to nonpartisan, non-advocative uh, academic programming. Uh, and it's this commitment that's at the core of the webinar series. The goal here is to provide, as Jennifer had noted, an opportunity for policymakers to gain valuable, unbiased knowledge about insurance and risk management. Uh, our speaker for this afternoon session is Dr. David Pusser, an assistant professor of risk management and insurance at St. John's University. Uh, Dr. Pusser received his PhD in risk management and insurance from Florida State University and he joined the St. John's University faculty in 2012. Uh, Dr. Pusser regularly presents research at regional and national academic conferences and he has papers accepted for publication or published in a variety of scholarly journals. Uh, to learn more about his background and research interests, we invite you to view his bio on the St. John's website. Uh, before we turn things over to Dr. Pusser, let me r remind you uh, very briefly that as webinar participants, each of you has been given complimentary access to self-paced online learning materials that coincide with the topics that the professor will cover today. Uh, you'll receive an email message from the Griffith Foundation with login information, also a unique username and password, which you can use to access these materials. Uh, and we hope that you'll refer back to the materials following the program as needed. Uh, they're intended to serve as a resource for you and again uh, available to you on a complimentary basis. Uh, with that, uh, I ask that you join me in welcoming Dr. Puser. Uh, we thank him for joining us today. Hey, uh, thank you Frank uh, and Jennifer for that introduction uh, and, and thank you to the Griffith Foundation as well as CSG for putting on this program. Uh, I think it's very important for legislators, anybody involved in policy making to understand the insurance industry a little better and hopefully that's something that we will help facilitate here today. So just to give you a brief overview of what I'm going to do, we're going to talk a little bit today about insurance coverages in the property and casualty insurance industry uh, and then I'm also going to pair that a little bit with an emerging risk that I, I hope you'll find interesting but something that's certainly going to be very significant to the insurance market as well as our overall economy in the coming uh, decades. Uh, and that is autonomous vehicles or driverless cars. But just to give you a brief overview of what the, uh, this, this lecture, this, this presentation today will be about, I'm, I'm going to briefly describe the property and casualty industry and what they cover. I'm going to talk a little bit about the emerging risk that we'll talk about today and then move on to some insurance coverages. So uh, here on this uh, first slide, first content slide, we see a little bit about the U.S. property and casualty insurance industry. It's a very economically significant industry. There are more than 2,500 companies in the United States writing some form of property and casualty insurance, and that ranges from these enormous companies like Geico or State Farm, who are writing many billions of dollars per year in coverage, all the way down to state-specific or even region, geographic area-specific companies, which might be writing uh, liability insurance for a certain sector of our population. In terms of economic impact, the property and casualty insurance uh, industry writes over $500 billion per year in net premiums, and that's been growing substantially in the last decade. So this is up at least oh, 50 or $60 billion since 2004. 
and auto insurance makes up more than one-third of that total amount. So auto insurance is the most economically significant line of business within the property and casualty insurance industry. And as we move forward and talk about driverless cars, I think that you'll see uh, why this is such an economically important development. Because if auto, in, uh, auto insurance, uh, total premiums written in the United States uh, for private passenger auto is somewhere in the neighborhood of $185 billion per year. When we add commercial auto insurance to the it grows substantially higher. So auto insurance in the United States is, is a major, major mover of the industry. And as we move forward and change some of the assumptions about what causes accidents and the frequency of accidents, we're going to really significantly impact this industry. In terms of employment, the property and casualty insurance industry directly employs more than 600,000 people. When we look at the people who are servicing these insurance companies, the brokers, the consultants working with insurance, this number grows, uh, again, substantially to well more than a million. And so the insurance coverages provided by property and casualty insurance companies include property, liability, business interruption, workers' compensation, and more. For example, uh, if you've ever heard of boiler and machinery coverage, this is more of a servicing contract, but it's also offered within the net of PNC insurance in the United States. Uh, next slide, please. So the number one, uh, you know, the, the first part of property and casualty insurance is property. So the number one type of risk that's insured by PNC insurance companies is property risk. And so property risk can be either uh, real or personal. Real property includes land, structures, and any permanent attachments to the structures on land. And just very generally, insurance does not actually cover the land that a structure is built upon. So if you have a homeowner's insurance policy, the coverage will uh, protect your home, it'll protect the actual building itself, but it doesn't protect the, the ground, the dirt, anything underneath it. Personal property includes anything that is mobile, anything within the, the confines of, an, of a uh, construct, within a building, within a home, or mobile equipment including cars, uh, dump trucks, uh, scooters, anything that you can move. Anything that is movable is considered personal property, either personal, per uh, excuse me, individual personal property or business personal property. And furthermore, property risk can be either direct or indirect. Direct property loss includes the cost to repair or replace property. Indirect property loss includes the lost revenue or increased expenses after a loss. So for example, if a restaurant suffers a fire, the restaurant owner will have to pay to renovate the building but they also suffer lost revenue and potentially increased expenses while they are repairing or replacing the building of their restaurant. Um, the indirect losses to, to property in some cases can be much, much larger than the actual property loss. Uh, it depends on the circumstance. Okay, next slide, please. Liability is the next large type of risk which is all provided by the property and casualty insurance industry. And so, as we talk about some of the coverages today, I'm going to talk about the public policy implications of why these coverages are important. And so liability insurance is often important because it protects a third party from somebody's negligent act. And that's typically what liability insurance does, is it covers somebody else for the negligent acts of the insured. When you buy car insurance, the only portion of the car insurance that's typically required is liability coverage. And that's not to protect you, the driver. It's to protect other people on the road. Uh, liability insurance will typically cover the amount of a judgment or settlement, so the amount of a lawsuit or how much the insurance company chooses to settle. And it also normally includes a legal defense, so it will pay for a lawyer, and that's often included as an additional benefit. So you don't have to reach your policy limits with these lawyer's fees. That's inc included in addition to coverage. Next slide, please. So very generally, the types of uh, coverage that we're going to talk about today will be auto, homeowners, and workers' compensation insurance. I'm also going to talk about a couple of important insurance markets, reinsurance and the excess and surplus lines market, which are connected to the PNC industry. But we're going to start today with auto insurance. Uh, and before I do that, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about driverless cars and why this is an important emerging risk. Next slide, please. So question is, what is an emerging risk? Uh, you could read. 10 different articles about emerging risks. You could look at 10 different sources and come up with 10 different definitions. But one that I really like, which was put out by the Risk and Insurance Management Society, is that an emerging risk is one uh, which an organization has not yet recognized or which is not yet known to exist or not well understood. So in other words, an emerging risk is one, it's one that is uh, still developing one that we don't have good information uh, yet. So it's something we, we might know that a risk event is likely to occur. We might know that this loss is possible, 
but we don't have information regarding the frequency or the probability or the likelihood of the loss, or we don't understand the potential impact of the loss. And so if we don't have that critical information, insurance companies don't know how to price the risk, and it becomes very difficult for businesses and individuals to manage these risks. And so uh, what are some examples of emerging risks? Uh, you might think of terrorism in the 1990s and, uh, 1990s and the early 2000s, and even today, we're still trying to understand what's the potential impact of terrorism, what's the likelihood, how do we mitigate the risk. So terrorism is viewed as an emerging risk. Uh, major emerging risks that the insurance industry uh, identify right now are cyber, climate change, and driverless cars. So cyber risk is major because every corporation now wants some kind of cyber insurance coverage. If you look at examples like Target, who had a major data breach, um, or J.P. Morgan, or, or other organizations who have had customer data leaked online, uh, other organizations are worried about the potential impact on their business, and they want to buy insurance for that. The insurance industry is reticent to provide that coverage, so it, this is one that we consider an emerging risk because, again, full information is not available. Driverless cars are another example, and so I think that there's a lot of excitement about driverless cars, but there's also a measure of anxiety because it's not very well understood right now. Next slide, please. And so just a little bit about driverless cars. Uh, the, the proper name, I suppose, uh, if you want to use that, is an autonomous vehicle. I prefer uh, to, to just use driverless cars, so you'll have to excuse me for that. But uh, we, we see a lot of development in this field right now, and there's a lot of talk about where is this going. And so right now, we have a number of, of autonomous features uh, that have, been, have, have existed for several years or are currently coming out including autonomous parking. Um, I've seen, I'm sure you've seen commercials for this, or maybe you've seen it in action. You uh, point the vehicle in the direction that you, you want it to be. You show it where, it, where to par uh, park, and some kind of rear view camera will back you into the spot automatically. I've never used that before, so I can't speak to how effective it is. But another example is adaptive cruise control. I believe Mercedes-Benz was very pivotal in coming out with this a few years ago, but adaptive cruise control essentially lets you choose how far to follow behind another vehicle, and rather than keeping to a constant speed, it keeps a constant distance to the vehicle in front of you. So this cruise control can actually speed up or slow down as traffic moves around you, uh, and so th this is another form of, of autonomy within a vehicle. Another example is collision warning. Uh, many cars are built with sensors that, that detect how close another vehicle or object is to the vehicle and will provide some level of warning, a beeping or something like that, before uh, that other object comes into contact with your car. And so I have here the next bullet point soon. What's developing soon in the future? Uh, Hands-free driving on the freeway or, or for low speed driving, and you can actually see that right now. Um, if you've been watching the news, Tesla just released their, and I'm trying to remember, uh, Autopilot, I believe, the Tesla Autopilot product, which was just released, uh, which is allowing, in some, some cases, for the driver to actually take their hands off the vehicle and take their foot off the gas or the brake pedal and allow the car to drive for them. And, of course, right now that requires some pretty specific parameters. You have to be driving, uh, driving excuse me, on a well-marked road. There have to be vehicles around you so that the cameras can view where you are in relation to other vehicles, where you are in relation to other things on the road, but it's a pretty incredible development. Uh, there's a, a, a video on YouTube of somebody allowing the car to drive for him, and he's, you can see that he's a little perplexed by how the car is doing that, but it's worth checking out if you haven't seen it. And then in the future, we're going to see a number of developments, and, and the time frame is a little ambiguous. Many people are saying that this could you know, take until 2045 or 2050. Some people are saying that more of these developments are going to be available in the next 10 years. But the, the ultimate end goal is that uh, a vehicle which can navigate from point to point on its own. So all you do is step foot in the vehicle, you enter your destination, and the car drives you there. That's the ultimate goal of an autonomous vehicle. And a big question that the PNC industry is facing right now is what's going to be the impact of driverless cars on the property and casualty industry? Okay, next slide, please. Well, from the perspective of auto insurance premiums, we can almost certainly say that driverless cars, autonomous vehicles, will make insurance premiums go down. That's not necessarily a bad thing because it means that the, the reduction in premium is an, a market reaction to reduction in accident frequency. So this is the biggest benefit that we're expecting to see from driverless cars is a major reduction in accident frequency. And there are a lot of sources that talk about what this reduction might be. 
uh, some sources say over 80% or 90% reduction. Uh, and for the record, uh, driver deaths have been declining rapidly in the last 15 years, in part because of electronic stability control within vehicles and just overall safer vehicles on the road. So as this trend continues, we should expect to see an, another sharp reduction in, in driver deaths, but also in accident frequency overall, which will help to reduce property damage within vehicles. Another major benefit we might expect to see from driverless cars are improved traffic patterns because most of these driverless cars use algorithms which have been developed by Google and Waze. Uh, you may know this from driving experience on your own, but the, the cars will be able to calculate the most efficient or the best route from point to point. Uh, and so that, that could be a major improvement for uh, uh, commuting distance, commuting time, and also for gas efficiency. Now, of course, this will have an economic impact as well. Insurance companies should expect to see a major reduction in premium. And as I just mentioned a few minutes ago, car insurance is the number one revenue source for the property and casualty insurance industry. In addition to uh, auto insurance companies, garages and car manufacturers may also expect to see a reduction in their revenue. Garages, auto garages, auto repair centers, because they're getting less work because fewer cars are being uh, damaged. Oh, excuse me. Uh, and car manufacturers as well, because there are some competing theories about what might happen, but some people are hypothesizing that ride sharing might become more prevalent. Fewer people might drive, uh, excuse me, uh, fewer people might purchase cars, and you might see more groups purchasing cars for use so that more people can use the same vehicle simultaneously. So if this is possible, car manufacturers may also expect to see fewer car sales in the future. Now another major cost, and this is one of the big pushbacks to driverless cars, is that driverless cars uh, spell less control for the driver, <clears throat> because by definition the car is autonomous. Excuse me for one moment. Oh, sorry about that. So that spells less control for the driver. And of course, people are concerned that uh, with the vehicle taking control of itself, navigating from point A to point B, what happens if something goes wrong? A lot of people don't want the car to be able to make all of the decisions for them. So this is one of the big areas of pushback right now to driverless cars. And as I'm going to discuss in just a few minutes, we're also going to see a major shifting of the responsibility for accidents and injuries perhaps from the driver of a car to the manufacturer of the car or the manuf manufacturer of the software which navigates the car. Okay, uh, next slide please. So the, the first insurance coverage we're going to talk about is the personal auto policy and I will have a special focus on driverless cars within this. Okay, next slide. The personal auto policy is made up of four basic coverages and in some states we also see this personal injury protection or no fault coverage uh, this is not common to every state, but there are a number of states which have adopted this. And so the, the, the four uh, major parts to the auto policy are liability, medical payments, uninsured motorist coverage, and physical damage coverage. Next slide, please. So part A, liability coverage, is the typically the only required portion of the auto insurance policy. And there are some states which have adopted medical payments or uninsured motorists as a required type of coverage, but in, in general, if we just survey all of the states in the U.S., the number one required coverage that we see is this, liability coverage. And so liability coverage is not necessarily protecting the driver of the vehicle. Liability coverage is protecting the other people on the road from the driver's actions. So if you as a driver injure somebody else while you're driving or you damage their property, liability coverage will pay for your legal defense in the, in the event that you're sued and will also pay to repair that person's property or for their bodily injury. Now, in order for liability coverage to pay out, the insured must be found legally responsible for the um, accident. And so this, this becomes a point of contention because oftentimes there is disagreement in who is responsible ultimately for an accident. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So what's going to be the impact of driverless cars on liability insurance? This is a major question the insurance industry is looking at right now. Because driverless cars will still be involved with accidents. There's no way that accidents are going to disappear, disappear entirely. But the question is, what's going to cause accidents in the future with driverless cars? 
is it going to be a failure in the physical technology, the vehicle itself, and that could be a failure in the braking mechanism, a failure in the inability to read road signs, a uh, failure in front-facing front cameras, things like that. Or could it be a failure in software technology, which is what's propelling the car, making it go from point A to point B? So the big question that we have to ask is, if cars are involved in accidents and there's nobody behind the wheel, there's nobody who's actually driving the car, who faces fault? Who is at fault for that accident? And so this is going to be the major policy question going forward is, who's liable for accident or injury when self-driving cars are taking control? And so one answer potentially could be an increase in the coverage of no-fault insurance. So many, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, many countries already have an, uh, a no-fault coverage for all vehicles, for all accidents. Um, I, I don't remember the country offhand, but one of the Scandinavian countries, I believe, has no liability coverage at all. All accidents are treated as no-fault coverage, and so if you're injured in a car accident, it doesn't matter who is at fault, your insurance company will pay for those damages. And we could see a shift to something like this in the U.S. Okay, next slide, please. The next part of the auto insurance policy is Part B, uh, medical payments. Part, uh, part B pays for uh, any kind of bodily injury, medical loss to an individual who is injured in a car accident when they're driving in their own car, when they are a pedestrian injured by another automobile, and it also extends to people who are occupants in an insured's vehicle. So let's say, for example, you're driving in your car and you have a friend in the passenger seat. You're injured in a car crash. It doesn't matter who's at fault. You, you could be at fault. Another driver could be at fault. If both of you have injuries that require um, a trip to the hospital, a trip to the doctor, whatever, the car insurance company will pay for both of those injuries regardless of fault. So that doesn't, that doesn't really matter. Um, the only thing that medical payments does not cover are lost wages or extra expenses after an accident. So if you require rehabilitation expenses uh, or if you, lose, uh, if, you, if you have to miss work for two weeks in order to be rehabilitated or because you're you know, at the doctor's office at home recovering, whatever, this insurance coverage does not protect you for that type of loss. Okay, next slide, please. So there's a potentially confounding factor with uh, this type of coverage in the future and the addition of driverless cars to the road. So two things that I'd like to mention are that driverless cars are expected to reduce accident frequency uh, by a significant portion, meaning that fewer people should be injured while driving. And secondly, the future of healthcare in the United States right now is very uncertain. Um, as you all are probably aware, uh, the PPACA, also known as Obamacare, was passed in 2010, which mandates health insurance coverage uh, for everybody except a, a very few number of people. And so going under the assumption that that is um, health insurance coverage is going to be certain in the future, which, you know, maybe maybe a good assumption, maybe a bad assumption, I don't know, but going under the assumption that health insurance coverage is going to be more widespread and also going under the assumption that accidents are going to be much, much less frequent, we might say, will this coverage disappear? And so that's a major policy question that you might think about. Will Part B medical uh, payments coverage even exist in 10 or 15 years? And so the insurance industry might have to decide whether or not they want to actually reshape the insurance policy um, to, to face this, or excuse me, to, to fit with this more modern shape of the insurance industry. Uh, and so that's something that's very uncertain right now that's going to depend on a couple of interactions, and that's, that is the interaction between uh, reduced ac accident frequency and the increase in health insurance coverage. Okay, next slide, please. The next portion of the auto insurance policy, one of my favorites, is uninsured motorist coverage. Um, when I say it's my favorite, it's one of my favorites to cover in class because I personally don't believe uninsured motorist coverage is necessary because it's not really doing anything for you that your Part B medical payment cannot do already. So uninsured motorist coverage will provide bodily injury protection to you and your vehicle, you as a pedestrian, and again, passengers within your vehicle, if you're injured by a hit and run driver, an uninsured motorist, or somebody whose insurance uh, is insolvent. So in other words, you are required to cover liability insurance by law, but we know that many drivers don't, 
uh, I believe that the estimate is that about 14 or 15 percent of drivers on the road do not have insurance. So what happens if you're injured by a negligent driver or a hit and run driver and then you don't have their insurance company to go after, what do you do in that case? Well, the traditional answer is that you have your uninsured motorist coverage to provide protection. But this only counts for bodily injury. This does not protect the actual physical damage to your car. So uninsured motorist coverage, Part C, and medical payments, Part B, actually do many of the same things. I suppose really the main difference is that Part C might also pay for some lost wages and might also pay for pain and suffering which is an economic damage, but not one that we can easily put a dollar amount on. So Part C is a first-party coverage that basically replaces the third-party coverage of another driver. That's uh, the essence of Part C coverage, this uninsured motorist. Uh, and so a couple of considerations for this um, going forward. Next slide, please. With driverless cars, is will this really be necessary? So this kind of, I'm just kind of reiterate, re reiterating the question that I had from the last slide. Will we really need uninsured motorist coverage going forward if we see this vast reduction in uh, auto accidents and we also see a shifting of liability? So that's another important question is if, the, if autonomous vehicles are making the decision on the road, will we need uninsured motorist coverage because we're not so much concerned about uh, uninsured motorists, we're consider concerned about the auto insurance companies, excuse me, uh, the auto manufacturers and the software manufacturers which are directing the vehicles on the road. So will uninsured motorist coverage be necessary? Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that, but again, if, if the insurance industry when the insurance industry decides to address the issue of driverless cars, this is going to be a major point of concern. I think that the auto insurance policy will change pretty dramatically um, at that point. Next slide, please. So the final portion of the auto insurance policy, and excuse me for just one moment. I'm sorry for uh, taking a pause there. I have a little bit of a cold that I'm fighting off, so I have my, my water and my Gatorade here to the side. But anyway, um, the final portion of the auto insurance policy, which is standard, is Part D, uh, which covers physical damage to a vehicle. Part D is what we typically think of when we consider auto insurance. So most people are not thinking of liability or medical payments. They're actually thinking about damage to their own vehicle, and that's what Part D coverage uh, is for. It is damage to your own vehicle, or to a non-owned auto that, that you use regularly. And of course, with uh, auto, excuse me, um, auto physical damage coverage, there is always a deductible as well. I guess in some cases you could elect to have no deductible, but your premium would be much higher. Uh, but next slide, please. So the two primary types of coverage we have are collision and other than collision coverage, which is also known as comprehensive coverage. Uh, collision coverage uh, covers uh, physical damage between your auto and collision with another vehicle, collision with some object like a telephone pole or a lamppost or something like that, or for overturning of the vehicle. So if a vehicle is driving down the road, if it makes a sharp turn uh, and flips over, it would be covered under collision coverage. Next slide, please. Other than collision coverage is the second part of the physical damage policy, uh, and this covers pretty much every other type of loss to the vehicle itself. So fire, theft, vandalism, hail, animal contact. You see I have a whole list here. Um, animal contact is an interesting one because a lot of people kind of ignore the need for that coverage. But if you live in a rural area, one of the biggest risks that you actually face while driving your vehicle uh, is striking a deer. Uh, people don't realize how, how major of an issue that is. Uh, animal contact is actually a multi-billion dollar per year form of loss for the auto insurance industry. Uh, and so this is, this is an important coverage to consider, especially for people living in more rural areas. And if you're living in an urban area, uh, I, I live in New York City, I don't own a vehicle, thank goodness here, but if I did, one of the big uh, concerns I might have would be theft or vandalism to my vehicle, other than collision coverage, also known as comprehensive coverage, would cover me for that type of loss. Okay, next slide, please. And so what's going to be the impact of driverless cars on physical damage coverage? Well, it's very, very unlikely that this type of insurance coverage will go away. 
As long as individuals own valuable assets, there will be insurance coverage to protect them. You think about the valuable assets that you own, your home, your vehicle, uh, you might own a boat, you might have jewelry, you might have other nice things, art, something like that that you care a lot about that is worth a lot to you. Most likely you own insurance for those goods. So as long as people own vehicles, there will be physical damage coverage for them. However, the cost of this insurance might be reduced dramatically within the next 10 to 20 years because of the advent of autonomous vehicles. If driverless vehicles are really going to be uh, as impactful as many people are estimating them to be, we could actually see a reduction between, and this is just my estimate, but it's an estimate based on reading numerous sources on this, we could see a reduction in auto insurance premium between 50 and 75 percent in the next 20 years uh, because of this extremely large reduction uh, in accident frequency. However, there's another big question, and that is what's going to happen to the cost per accident? So what's going to happen to you know, the, the individual accidents which occur? Are they going to go up or down in value? And there's a competing hypothesis, I suppose, with this. One is, and I, I read this in an article somewhere, I don't remember where, but I read that driverless cars drive like your grandma would. So driverless cars take no risks. They follow all of the speed limit signs. They follow all stoplight signs. They are extremely safe. So one theory is that if these vehicles are getting in an accident, it's not going to be as severe because they're not going as fast. But the competing hy hypothesis is this, is that driverless cars will rely on computer components and other components which are very, very costly. Uh, it would be very expensive to repair or replace these parts. And so driverless car coverage might actually, excuse me, uh, uh, the physical damage coverage might actually go up for these vehicles because there's more technology being employed in the cars themselves. Next slide, please. So the final uh, portion of the auto insurance policy I want to touch on is no fault or PIP, personal injury protection coverage. Uh, this is required in some states, but not all. Um, and, and this is one of those that, in my opinion, this works well in theory. In practice, there have been some issues with it. But the idea is that with minor, minor injuries to individuals, and again, this is not a property damage coverage. This is only for bodily injury. In some cases uh, that are, where there's a somewhat minor bodily injury, so you know, a, a, a strained back, whiplash, something like that, something uh, that, that can be handled without a big hospital visit. We don't want that to go to the court system. We don't want people suing over these minor injuries, so we should have no fault insurance. No matter who caused the accident, your insurance company will pay for your losses. And this shouldn't be reflected in your insurance premium either. This shouldn't make your insurance premium go up or down because we're, we're leaving this out of the court system. We're not assigning fault at all. And so the idea of no fault coverage is that the insurance company will pay you your medical expenses, any lost wages for work you have to miss, and then extra expenses, which might be uh, uh, daily living activities such as cooking and cleaning, taking care of a child. Um, if you have to go to an extended care facility for a certain period of time, it would pay for that. But the insurance company will pay for all of that without regard to any fault. So it doesn't matter who was at fault in the accident, uh, PIP will pay no matter what. Next slide, please. So just an impact summary for driverless cars. What do we expect to see uh, from the advent of driverless cars on the insurance industry? Um, well, there's potentially a major reduction in the total premium, and that, that might be the biggest impact. And so how will this affect the insurance industry? Well, the, insu the property and casualty insurance industry collects over $180 billion in premiums right now for auto insurance only. If we see a major reduction in that, we might also have to see a major scale back in the auto insurance workforce. So insurance companies employ many people in the selling of insurance and the servicing of insurance, which includes people who are adjusting auto uh, insurance claims. And so many of these people might have to be retrained or find different jobs. And so this has a workforce implication in that people working in garages, people working in car insurance claims might need uh, a different job. We're also going to see a shift in the liability of who is responsible for accidents from the driver to the manufacturers of the vehicles and the manufacturers of the software which are guiding the vehicle. And this is going to be a major market change because it's going to change how much insurance we actually have to buy. So we might not need the same quantity of insurance that we used to have because we are not as responsible for the actions of the vehicle going forward into the future. It's possible, I'm not going to say that this is, uh, uh, in what, what percentage I think this is possible, but this is just an, a possibility overall, 
that we see an increase in no-fault coverage. Or in other words, we see it that a movement from coverage that is that you know assigns fault for an accident to uh, coverage that says, well, it doesn't matter who was responsible for the loss. If you were injured by this loss, if your uh, property was injured, da uh, excuse me, your property was damaged by this loss, the insurance company will pay no matter what. And another important thing is that we are going to see an increase in, in, I believe, in telematics in terms of measuring the vehicle's use. So people have not been eager to adopt telematics, which is uh, measuring how far they drive each day, how fast they drive, what areas of a city that they're driving in, in order to provide more accurate underwriting results. People don't want the insurance company to have that kind of information for their vehicles. But autonomous vehicles will record that information automatically because they collect tons of information about where the car is going every day. And so we might see a shift to usage-based insurance where you are charged more or less depending on how much you use your vehicle. If you only drive five miles per day, you might pay a much lower auto insurance premium than if you drive 25 or 30 miles per day because you're on the road less. You're, you're less exposed to auto loss. Okay, so that's the end of the uh, PAP section. We can move on from here. Frank, I don't know if you have any anything here. Sure, uh, David, thank you very much. Uh, a number of very interesting uh, questions uh, posed here uh, by you and some great information. Uh, just a reminder for those participating, if you have questions of the professor and you want to submit them electronically, please uh, feel free to take a moment and do so. Uh, we do have a, a couple of questions that have come in and uh, I'll take a moment and pose one or two of those. Time is uh, of the essence here, so uh, we'll cover uh, a few questions and then we'll need to move on because we want to uh, to talk next about the homeowner's insurance policy. But first, uh, one question uh, submitted uh, asks, Professor, what if you're injured by a driver who carries liability insurance as legally required but who carries very low limits of coverage? Uh, could you respond to uh, to that question? Sure. Uh, so, I, I talked about uninsured motorist coverage as Part C of the, the car insurance policy, uh, and this provides liability coverage for another driver if you are injured by them. So, if you're hit by a driver that doesn't have insurance, this basically substitutes for their liability coverage. But in many states, the liability insurance requirement is very low, maybe only ten or $20,000, and it's of course possible to have injuries which are much, much higher than that. So, what happens if you're hit by a car? Uh, and, and your, your hospital bill is $50,000, but they only have $10,000 in liability coverage. Well, one option is that you can add an endorsement, which is a little add-on to your car insurance policy, uh, which in, it, it moves from uninsured motorist to uh, un, underinsured motorist coverage. So we have uninsured motorist and underinsured motorist coverage. And so you can actually basically substitute your own liability coverage for that other driver, even if they do have the required liability coverage for the state, but that liability limit is very low. So there's a way to increase that, and it's just that you would add this endorsement or add-on to the policy. Thank you, Professor. Uh, before we transition to discussion of uh, the homeowner's insurance policy, uh, let us uh, share one more question, uh, and that is this. Uh, what are common types of auto insurance fraud? If you could take a moment or two to uh, address that, we'd appreciate it. And again, uh, before you do so, we remind uh, those participating uh, throughout the webinar, if you have questions or, uh, and or would like to share those with us, please feel free to do so using the, uh, the electronic uh, box that you have before you. So uh, fraud takes several forms. <clears throat> um, and you know, when we think about fraud, we think about that, that intentionally causing damage in order to collect uh, on a loss. And that certainly is something that happens a lot. Um, if you live around lakes or canals or rivers or anything, it's very common for people simply to push their cars. You know, if you have an old beat up car, something that you don't want to own anymore, simply push that into a waterway and then report the car stolen. That's actually a very common form of insurance fraud. Another, uh, if you can think about this the next time you're eating potato chips, a big bag of Lay's potato chips placed on the engine block of a car, uh, and then if you close, you close the hood, turn the car on, uh, the, the engine gets hot enough typically to set the bag on fire, and the bag contains enough grease to burn through the engine block. That's another co common cause, or excuse me, common form of physical damage fraud. But another common form of fraud that we don't even think about that's very widespread is lying about the use of the vehicle. So a lot of people simply tell the insurance company they park it in a different area than it's actually parked in. 
they don't drive as many miles per week that they, as they actually do, or that they're using the vehicle for a less dangerous purpose than is true. So people who use the vehicle as a livery might lie, as, lie about that. Um, so those are probably the most common forms of fraud. We have physical damage fraud and then underwriting fraud, which is lying to the insurance company to get a lower premium. Thank you very much, Professor Puzer. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, let's uh, move on to our next segment here on the homeowner's insurance policy. Yeah, and if we could uh, if we move on to slide 26, I'll start talking about the coverages. I know that we're a little pressed for time, so I'll probably move a little quickly through this. But homeowner's insurance is extremely important because it protects individuals. And so there's uh, three, well, there, there's six different coverages you can see here. We have A through F. But there are three main types of coverage that we see. We have coverage for property, which are coverages A, B, and C in Section 1. Coverage for the loss of use of the home or extra expenses after the home. And then we have liability coverages. And if we can uh, move to the next slide. Um, within Section 1, uh, coverages A and B, we have protection for the, the structure itself, the home itself, and any external structures as well, such as a detached garage or a tool shed or a storage shed, swimming pool, etc. Um, and this, this coverage is typically offered on a replacement cost basis. Um, so homeowner's insurance is extremely important that if an individual's home is burned down, they not be penalized for the age of the home. This is from a con consumer protection motive. So homeowner's insurance is typically offered on a, a replacement cost basis. Um, and and the, the same can be uh, applied for extra external structures such as detached garages or pool houses, something like that. And then um, I, I have a note here that the perils insured against depend on the policy. So some homeowners insurance policies are very broad and offer coverage for almost any type of loss. Some are more basic and only cover the basic types of loss, which would typically be fire, windstorm, hail, lightning, explosion, and a few others. Okay, next slide, please. Coverages uh, C and D are also within section one of the homeowners insurance policy. Coverage C is another property insurance coverage, but this is property insurance coverage for the contents of the home and your own personal property. So for example, your furniture, your appliances, your clothing, and this actually applies uh, to your personal property anywhere that you are in the world. So if you're traveling, uh, and you let's say that you're traveling for business and you bring two suits and several sets of clothing and a couple of pairs of really nice shoes and you have a very nice piece of luggage and you bring a couple of other things and you're, you're traveling with $1,500 to $2,000 in clothes and it's lost or it's stolen or it burns up in a fire or whatever, your homeowner's insurance policy will actually pay for that loss. So personal property uh, coverage is part of the homeowner's policy. And coverage D, the last part of section one, is the loss of use of the home. So if you remember one of the first slides I talked about property risk, I mentioned that property uh, can be either direct or indirect property loss. And so for indirect property loss, after a home uh, is damaged or destroyed, let's say by a fire, there might be a couple of things going on. Number one, you and your family most likely will have a lot of extra expenses because you'll have to rent another home or you'll have to uh, stay in a hotel room for an extended period of time while your home is being repaired or replaced. And second, many people actually rent out a room in their home to somebody else or they use their home, you know, yeah, typically that's what it is. So you rent out a room or you rent out two rooms to other people, and so you have lost revenue while the home is being replaced as well. Insurance will pay for both of those types of losses, the increase in expense and uh, the rental value of the home while it's being repaired. Okay, next slide, please. Section 2 of the homeowner's insurance policy provides liability protection. And so liability protection is a third party coverage, which means that it's not covering your losses, it's actually covering somebody else's losses. And so the uh, primary portion of the homeowner's insurance policy in, in section two is personal liability coverage. This is typically sold with a $100,000 per occurrence basis, uh, which can actually be increased typically to 300 or even $500,000. And this is one of the most important types of coverage you can have. Many people only think about the, the, the coverage for their structure and they ignore the liability proportion. But the question is, what if somebody's at your house and they're injured? What if your dog bites somebody? What if you are in the shopping center and you accidentally knock somebody down with your shopping cart and they have a broken leg? And then they sue you. Who will provide protection for that? And the answer in all of those cases would be your homeowner's insurance policy. And in fact, dog bite or well, more, more generally animal cause losses 
are the uh, largest form of personal liability losses. I think they make up about one third of total personal liability claims within the homeowner's insurance policy. Um, and the frequency of those animal caused losses has been declining, but the severity has been increasing. So the cost per dog bite, et cetera, has been going up over the last few years. Okay. And another important part of this coverage is that the insurance company will pay for a legal defense. So in addition to paying for any types of loss that you might suffer, the insurance company will also pay for a lawyer to defend you. Okay, next slide, please. The next portion of section two are medical payments. And so this is a no fault coverage. If some, it's, it's, this is also called a goodwill coverage. So no matter who is injured on your home, and now this is not for you, the homeowner, this is for other people that are on your home. If somebody who does not live in your home is injured on your home, no matter who was at fault, no matter who caused the injury, the homeowner's insurance company will pay for medical expenses, typically up to about $5,000 um, that they might have, and that is to prevent a lawsuit in the future, and that's why it's called goodwill coverage. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, okay, and so I wanna talk a little bit about the perils with homeowner's insurance. Uh, perils are the cause of a loss. So for example, fire, lightning, windstorm, hail, flood, earthquake, et cetera. Um, and, and we might talk a little bit about those, uh, some of those last two I mentioned in, in a little bit, but um, policies can be sold on either a named perils or an open perils basis. And when a policy is sold on a named perils basis, what it means is that only the perils, only the types of loss which are specifically described in the policy are covered. If something else happens to the home, if some other type of loss happens, then those losses would not be covered. An open perils policy is sold on, that, uh, on the basis that it covers all types of loss no matter what, unless the peril is specifically excluded. And so some commonly excluded types of loss would be war, um, in, intentional loss, or flood. So flood losses are typically excluded by the homeowner's insurance policy. Okay. And I know we went through that fairly quickly um, because I'm, I, I would like to finish this on time, but um, if you would like to, I, I believe on the Griffiths web website, there is a self-paced learning section so that you can actually go look at some learning materials related to this as well, hopefully to supplement the slides. Okay. Indeed, um, Professor, there is, uh, there is self-paced material available, uh, and each of the participants will uh, receive an email message from Griffith with access information. Uh, so uh, we would encourage them to, to make use of that for sure. Um, in the interest of time, uh, we do have uh, a couple of questions here, and I think uh, we will pose uh, just one question to you before we transition into workers' compensation insurance and that uh, time is drawing near. Uh, and that question is, uh, are losses to the structure of the home paid on the basis of cost to replace or the market value of the property? Okay, uh, that's, that's an important question. Um, so the reason that the home is, so home losses are paid on a replacement cost basis. Uh, losses to the structure of the home are paid on the basis to replace the home. So think about it this way. If you, had a, if you were driving around in a 1995 Ford truck, which is my favorite model, by the way, um, and it was destroyed, you would not expect them to give you the money to buy a 2015 Ford truck. And the reason for that is that the insurance industry knows that if they pay to replace old property, people will try to have intentional losses so that they can get new property. Well, that same logic doesn't really hold for the home. And so we want to protect consumers. So most states have this replacement cost law in place, and it's called a valued policy law, that states that homeowner's insurance has to be sold on a replacement cost basis. So that if your home that was built in 1930 is destroyed by a fire, you're not only receiving fifteen or $20,000 when it's going to cost you $200,000 to rebuild. So homeowner's insurance is sold on a replacement cost basis because that is a consumer protection motive. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Professor. We, yeah, sure thing. And can we go to slide 34, please? So workers' compensation insurance is the next coverage we're going to talk about. And so workers' comp coverage is uh, a, an, a liability type of policy. It's not exactly liability because there's no lawsuit going on, but it is a third-party coverage. It's coverage that is purchased by an employer in order to protect the employee. Workers' comp coverage is called an exclusive remedy in many states because it limits the, the right or the ability of the employee to sue for an injury, but it also obligates the employer to pay for the employee's injuries if those injuries um, come from on-the-job activities. So if an injury or an illness occurs from something that happened while they were on the job, the employer is responsible for paying for those injuries. 
And the purpose of having this as an exclusive remedy is to keep these cases out of the court system, to reduce litigation costs for both parties, and to increase, or excuse me, to reduce the amount of time it takes to pay these claims so that these claims are paid promptly. Next slide, please. And so the major coverages provided by workers' comp insurance are medical expenses, so the cost of going to a hospital or a clinic, and any costs that follow, disability income coverage, so that if you are not able to work, workers' comp insurance will actually provide you with income during the interim period, rehabilitation benefits, this helps you get back to work faster, and then in the unfortunate event that the employee actually dies as a result of the accident, they also pay death benefits to the family. Next slide, please. So who is covered by workers' compensation insurance? Um, every state in the United States, with the exception of Texas, um, requires employers to purchase workers' comp insurance unless uh, the workers are exempt, which is only a few, uh, few employees. And that is for small businesses with a very few number of employees. And depending on the state, that might be five, it might be 10. Farm labor, um, domestic employees, people work, uh, working in the home, people who are casual employees, or in other words, people who are, are only hired for a specific task like a handyman, and then certain independent contractors, but even that line has been blurred, the line between whether or not an independent contractor is covered by workers' comp or not. Certain states say yes, certain states say no, and I think it depends on the nature of the work and the amount of control that the independent contractor has over their job. Okay, next slide, please. So how do we ensure that employers are able to pay for the workers' comp claims? And so typically the answer is that we have, they have to buy insurance. And so they can buy insurance through an insurance market, or they can demonstrate the ability to pay through self-insurance. Next slide, please. And so with the insurance markets that are available uh, include private insurance, which is voluntary coverage. So you know, you think about if you need car insurance, how do you buy it? You go to State Farm, you go to Liberty Mutual, you go to your independent agent. The same is true for workers' compensation insurance. You need insurance coverage for your employer, uh, excuse me, your employees. Where do you buy it? You go to the insurance market and you try to find coverage voluntarily. If your business is viewed as being too high risk due to loss history or due to the type of work you're doing, you might have to buy assigned risk coverage, which is where you actually go to the state and you are placed involuntarily with an insurance company. And then certain states uh, actually have a state fund, which might be competitive. So this would be a state-administered fund, which competes with the insurance market, or monopolistic. Uh, and so there are a few states that also have monopolistic coverage in which um, the state provides all of the workers' comp insurance within the state. Next slide, please. Other companies, if they are large enough, or if they have a network with other companies, might set up a self-insurance plan. The idea behind a self-insurance plan is that you have a large number of employees, and so you can very accurately predict how many losses you might have in a given year and set aside funds to pay for those losses. So you're doing exactly what an insurance company would do. You set aside funds to pay for losses. When the loss occurs, you go ahead and pay for it out of that set of funds, and you avoid the middleman. You avoid the insurance company in this entire mix. Now, of course, companies need to be careful when they do this because they underestimate how difficult it is to actually settle claims and investigate the validity of claims, something that insurance companies are very good at doing. But self-insurance can be a very viable plan, especially for many larger employer, employers who have a, a large number of employees. Okay, uh, next Thank slide, you, please. Professor. Uh, one question for you on the workers' comp side. Uh, okay. And that is, can employers affect the price of workers' compensation insurance coverage that they obtain from the insurance market? Okay, so in other words, can employers change how much they pay for workers' comp coverage? Um, yes, and so the, the typical answer here is through loss control. Loss control, uh, also known as mitigation, are uh, controls that are trying to reduce the likelihood of a loss or the impact of a loss. So if you have a lot of workers who are working around hand press, uh, machines. You might buy them some kind of reinforced glove or you might put some kind of a hand guard under the machine that would prevent the machine from uh, smashing somebody's hand. If you have uh, employees who are lifting heavy items all day, you would probably train them how to lift so that they injure themselves less frequently and you might purchase them specialty clothing or other equipment that protects their back when they're lifting, which would reduce both the probability or the, the likelihood of a loss as well as the impact of the loss if it does occur. So there are a lot of things that workers, excuse me, employers can do to increase safety 
and that in turn typically reduces workers, workers' comp insurance premiums. Thank you, Professor. Okay, uh, and so if we can move on now to excess and surplus insurance, um, when we can start on with slide uh, 42. So just a little brief overview before I, I really get into this. Excess and surplus lines insurance is specialty insurance. So every time you think about a really obscure risk or something that's hard to place, some kind of coverage, you would say, how did that person get insurance? Oftentimes the answer is excess and surplus lines coverage. So the excess and surplus lines market is most typically part of the property uh, casualty insurance market, but it's a little bit separate because it's not as regulated as the property and casualty market. So they are able to charge basically whatever premium they want, and they can also cover many types of risk that the standard market might not. And so you can see I have a bullet point list here of some different types of coverage they might provide, um, and we'll, we'll walk through a few of these. Uh, so if we could move to the next slide, please. So one of the coverages they provide is for unusual or unique exposures. Um, and, and the reason that standard insurance companies can't provide that is that because they have to have a large number of insureds in order to enable accurate loss prediction. And so this is, if you ever took a statistics class, you probably heard of the law of large numbers. That's what insurance companies use in order to accurately predict losses. Now, if you're writing some kind of insurance that doesn't have a lot of insureds, you might not be able to use that same level of prediction. And so uh, excess and surplus lines insurance companies will step in and provide that coverage so um, some, some types of risk you might see here, um, major types of property like a cruise ship or a commercial jet um, would be provided through the excess and surplus market. Or event cancellation for a major band or singer. Um, Michael Jackson passed away, I believe, in 2009 or 10. Um, and Lloyd's of London, if you've heard of the Lloyd's market, uh, paid out about $100 million in event cancellation because uh, several promoters had to uh, cancel those concerts and they lost a, a lot of money from ticket sales, from refunding ticket sales. And so there are insurance companies that will pay for that type of loss. Uh, next slide, please. So excess and surplus lines and uh, excess and surplus lines insurance companies will also pay for losses for non-standard businesses or places with very, very high risk. And so typically we, we look at these things as things uh, like, like writing condominium insurance in the Florida Keys. Um, I spoke with a broker who wrote excess and surplus lines insurance for the uh, Miami Heat's basketball stadium, uh, basketball arena. So anything that where the risk is extremely high, you have coverage that's very hard to place, the excess and surplus market can stand in. Next slide, please. Uh, other types of coverage that the ENS market provides are very high limit policies, uh, or if we need to cover types of risks that are not typically insured, like flood insurance. Flood insurance is almost always excluded from the standard uh, insurance policy, but you can add that back in, typically by going to the excess and surplus market. If you're a homeowner, you can go to the National Flood Insurance uh, Program, which is offered through the federal government, but if you're a business owner, you typically have to get that from the private market, and that's oftentimes ENS companies which provide that. Okay, next slide, please. So excess and surplus lines insurance is uh, regulated, but it's less regulated than standard insurance. And what that means is that they are not using standard policy forms. So the, the actual contracts they sell are not reviewed by the state regulator. The prices they charge are not reviewed by the state regulator. But they do still have to meet all of the financial requirements of a standard insurance company. So excess and surplus lines insurance companies, because they write these uh, kind of crazy, unusual policies does not necessarily mean that they're dangerous companies. And in fact, there have been a number of studies that have shown that these companies are much, much safer than the standard insurance market due to self-policing or self-governance. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, Professor, in the interest of time, uh, I think it may make sense to transition into a very brief uh, discussion of uh, reinsurance and that we are uh, coming close to our uh, yeah, uh, sure, I can, time here. I can just sum up reinsurance if you'd like to move on to slide uh, uh, 48, please. Okay, so you, I have a little blurb about there and I have some other slides, but reinsurance, uh, the way that I teach this to my class, or the way that I describe it is reinsurance is insurance for insurance companies. So if you have an insurance company, I'm, I'm from Florida, so I like to use this risk. If you have an insurance company who is exposed to catastrophe risk because they write in a hurricane prone state, they're worried about that tail risk. They're worried about that really, really big loss 
from a Katrina, I know that hit New Orleans, but or from a Wilma or a, a, an Andrew or something like that, they're worried about that big risk affecting their entire book of business. So they can actually send off excess risk to a reinsurance company. And there are other purposes of reinsurance as well. Reinsurance companies provide extra capital to insurance companies so that they can grow more quickly and more safely. Reinsurance companies can provide capacity to insurance companies to provide very large coverages. For example, if you had a client with a $100 million building and you don't want to write any risk in excess of $20 million, you as an insurance company can take on the whole risk and then transfer part of that to a reinsurance company. So reinsurance companies basically supplement and complement primary insurance companies, but they don't sell directly to individuals. So reinsurance companies are there to support the insurance industry. They increase the financial stability and solvency of the insurance industry, but they don't sell directly to insureds. Um, and I would say that's, I think that's pretty much all I have to say with that. You can, you can look through the slides um, remaining to, you know, see some other details, but if you have any questions about that, I, I would welcome them. Dr. Puzer, thank you very much. Um, we thank uh, all of uh, our participants as well in the public policymaker realm for joining us today. Um, and we remind folks that uh, as webinar participants, we mentioned at the beginning of the program, and uh, Professor Puzer had referenced this as well partway through the program, uh, that you'll all receive complimentary access to self-paced online learning materials. Uh, you can expect to receive an email message from the Griffith Foundation over the next day or so. It'll contain a link and a username and password that will uh, allow you to access uh, materials that complement the professor's presentation today. So any items that uh, you want to delve into more deeply, uh, we would encourage you to do so through the self-paced online learning tool uh, and to keep that uh, on hand as a resource. Uh, again, it's uh, complimentary uh, and uh, we make it available through our collaboration with CSG. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Pusser. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Fuser, and thank you, Frank. Um, that concludes our webinar for today. I'd like to recommend that everybody join us next week for part three in this series when we will hear from uh, another professor um, as we, we continue our discussion about risk management insurance. Um, it will occur at Tuesday or Thursday, I'm sorry, at two o'clock Eastern time. So I hope everybody has a good afternoon, and we hope to see you back next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.